That is true. You are deeply, deeply loved. Deeply loved by the Father. Find refreshment in His presence. Find refreshment in His wonderful family and love among us that flow of streams of living waters. May they refresh you. May they wash away all the worries, all the burdens, all the anxieties. May you find strength, strength in his presence, in his promises, and in that deep identity that he is a good, good father. Whatever you walk through right now, that you are aware that he is a good father for you. And there are great purposes in the midst of it. What a privilege to be so loved by our living Father who is among us. When my dad passed away some years ago, I had moments of great sadness. And one day, Lauren came and we talked together, I think it was on the phone, and he said he had such a good father, such a good earthly father. You need a fresh revelation of your heavenly Father that is eternally always with you. That will never leave you. That will never go. That will always be there. And he prayed for me. And something of that reality, of that awareness, of that truth in my spirit kind of got unlocked to know he is always there. May this Father's presence refresh you right now. May this be like a foundation for all what He has called you to do, to build on, to rejoice in and to walk with Him and find every day that great joy of His presence such a privilege to be embedded in a family like YWAM. Last night when we celebrated, Lord, and your birthday, thank you for allowing us to celebrate with you. This is such an important part of our family that we can not look at tasks, not look at our ministry, but at the reality of our social family truth and celebrate. That was so well done. Thank you, David and Jill, for leading us through this evening. And also a big thank you to the event management school under Julie Spencer's leadership. Well done. Yes. Isn't this great that in our family we have a university embedded where we have such great events that are done so well together with people that are on a learning season of actually practicing what they have learned in a school and blessing all of us. What a great joy. Now, yesterday was a day where God spoke powerfully to us. I think everyone got touched yesterday by that truth that was shared from so many different people. Even our cameraman this morning I talked with, or we chatted about how this event all goes, and he said, yesterday, yesterday was such an amazing day. I'm an Anglican, he said, but what I learned yesterday, that has really impacted me deeply. Yesterday, we made a commitment. They are registered in heaven. They are a part of our life, of how God leads us as we make commitments and covenants. His leadership is based on what we committed. His leadership is based on what we covenant together. They stand firm. In this commitment, the question is, how do we work this out? And we just want to take a moment to talk about this together. To see what is God 
inspiring you? What is he uh, what is he speaking to you how to work out this commitment? Often in the moment, like yesterday, there is so much that God impresses on our hearts that he speaks to us, ideas that are coming up while someone presents, things we know that we are called to do. They are very precious. And we need to guard them that no one can steal them, rob them, take them away, but that we can actually do them. So we committed that we are engaging with translation, that we are engaging with production of the Word of God in many formats, that we are going to distribute it in one way or the other, that we are engaging in education, in teaching people the word of God and pass this on to every generation to the people around us near and far and we also committed that we gonna call for engagement that it is not just putting the Bible on someone's doorstep and run away but actually wait there and see when the door opens and the old lady stands there And you say, how are you doing? She said, I have a doctor's appointment, but I don't know how to get there. You say, here is a Bible, thank you, and you run away. (laughs) No, you're going to say, I have a car, I bring you to the doctor's appointment. And you smile at her, you hold her hand, you bring her to the car, to the doctor's appointment. While she's at the doctor's, you go under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and go to the store and shop for her a nice bag with food and a flower bouquet and when she comes out you bring her home fill her fridge and her table with beautiful flowers and you teach her the Bible that's our engaging this is not just distributing Bibles like we would distribute other things in a marketing sense this is engaging What is God speaking to you? Let's just take a moment and talk. Turn around to a few people around you, two or three, and share what us, we had yesterday, such an impactful teaching, showing us opportunities, giving us vision, and giving us the tools how to implement that. This is a wonderful season we are living in. Our forefathers would have dreamed to have all of that on a little tablet. We have opportunities that generations never had. How are we going to respond to that? What is God speaking to you? What is he showing you? Let's talk. Take a few minutes. Turn around. Let's all talk together. Yes. We are not talking from here. It's you talking. You talk what God is speaking to you.
Okay, friends. That sounds so good. You should hear this wonderful sound of great sharing. Let's just hear. Friends, let's all bring closure to our talks. And let's listen to a few of you. Huh? Okay. I come and down to you and I ask you, what is God speaking to you? Let's all listen to one another, okay? I go here to the back and I see, let's all see here, where do we go? Okay, hi, I'm Marcus. What's your name? Michelle. Why don't you stand, Michelle? This is Michelle. From where are you from? Hong Kong. Hong Kong, great. What is God speaking to you about the ending Bible poverty now. What are you going to do? I hold it. Okay. the education of the Bible and we're, we've been asked our ministry by a group in Burma in Myanmar to help plant another SBS among their church there so that's probably the next direction for me and my, the ministry I'm a part of. That's great. Let's give a big hand to Tim. That's a wonderful step ahead. Let's go down here and see on this end. Hello. My name is Marcus. What is your name? Bruce Litchfield. Oh, great, Bruce. Why don't you stand? What are you going to do? You are more life experienced, so you have a lot of treasures in you. What are you going to do? Uh, well, we've just come back from Cameroon, and we're actively involved in ministering in developing countries in relation to the family. And how are you going to end the Bible poverty now? Well, I'm very much into Bible study and encouraging people to read the Bible to start off with, especially YWAMers, and now I'm to, I'll, I'll <laughs> Yes, we need that. Let's give a big hand to Bruce. Well done. And let's go in here quickly. Hi, I'm Marcus. What is your name? Uh, my name is Dylan. Yes, yep. Dylan. What are you going to do? Um... Yeah, I'm just really excited to get the Source View Bible and to share it with uh, youth because I'm working or I'm doing a School of Innovative Youth Ministry in YWAM Newcastle right now. So I just really am excited to be able to show them the Jesus film and to connect with them in that way. Wonderful. Let's give a big hand to Dylan. So those are just a few examples. The important thing is that when God speaks to us that we are writing this down, that we are engraving that on the tablets of our hearts and that we are faithful to actually do that. We have learned yesterday that we can do this together with the rest of the body of Christ to end the Bible poverty now. Yes, we can. That's wonderful. Today we have a great day ahead of us. We will have David Cole come and lead us with a variety of our uh, leaders through a, a great family story, uh, exploring, understanding what God is doing in our family around the world and how we are uh, moving forward together. Then we're going to have in the afternoon the option to uh, see the ships, so who has not put their feet on the ship yet? Oh, wow, wow, wow. So this is the afternoon where you have the opportunity to do a tour on the ship. And then you can eat out there. 
There is food out there. And tonight we're going to have a wonderful celebration. We are building up from last night. We are commissioning two ships this evening. And you saw the video the other day of the handing over of the ship from New Zealand to YWAM here in Australia. And you can testify tonight the handing over of a ship that is given to uh, YWAM ships in Kona. And you can be a part of the commissioning of these two ships. This is a historic moment where we need our family together. We need your prayers. We need your witnessing what God is doing. And that is a very special moment for our family. We are also going to commend leaders. So this is celebration of fruitfulness tonight. We're going to commend about 60 leaders that have walked through development, learning. They have acquired a lot of skills, a lot of uh, experience, and a lot of knowledge. And tonight we celebrate what God has done in their lives. And from the University of the Nations, we're going to uh, commend them with their degrees, their AA degrees, their bachelor degrees, and about 50 master degrees that we are commending people with and commissioning them to a fruitful life. Yes, let's give a big hand. So today is a day of, of much networking in the afternoons. The expo is open, continue that wonderful networking together and then let's all move out to the to the wharf and there is shuttles ready that's all shown on the program and we are looking so much forward to have another great evening of celebration what God is doing good excellent so let's move on and welcome David Cole Great. What a wonderful, rich time we're having in the YWAM family, isn't it? And we're in for another rich time this morning. How many know that as a family grows and stretches and expands, there's all sorts of pressures, there's all sorts of joys, and how many know that just in their own personal lives? Any families here? Yes. I've seen many children, many young couples. It's wonderful just to see the growth and the life happening naturally and spiritually in and through this family called YWAM. Now, today we're going to go on a little bit of a journey. We cannot touch everything, but uh, we're going to have uh, our dear friend John Dawson come and share uh, for the first part of the morning. And he's going to just share some of the narrative that we've been through as a family. And I, I think as we've just been meeting this week, we're aware of a very, very special work of God that he's done in our lives as a whole family in preparing us for the future. That we're going into a future of great multiplication, great expansion, and great joy. And yet, it, there will be battles too in the future. But we're in it together as a family. How many know that in a family, you stick together, you fight together, and you lay down your lives for one another. Isn't that right? So we're here to do that. And uh, John is a very uh, precious uh, person. Also, Julie, I wonder, Julie, if you just stand up. Let's just, you know, often it's, it's the wife. And Julie Dawson. <clears throat> Julie and John have been in YWAM for so many years. And John has been, for some of those who are fairly new, he was the president of YWAM uh, for many years. John has a prophetic role uh, in the nations and the body of Christ, not just within our own mission. And we honor that, John. We honor you. This man, I, I, don't, I can't speak highly enough of him. I've seen him behind the scenes. He, he's a good friend, and he has just been such a gift of God to us as a family. So would you just welcome John as he comes this morning. Well, 
This is really just a conversation today <clears throat> with the Heavenly Father through the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Thank you, Father. We love you, Lord. Thank you for giving us the gift of this family. You know, as we were <clears throat> thanking Lauren last night, and we were thinking about this and praying for it <clears throat> a few days ago. The Lord reminded me of what he had spoken to some of us as we were praying about 13 years ago. And uh, I wonder if you would just join with me in, I want to bless you, Lauren and Darlene. There's a blessing in Genesis 49. And some years ago, as I was praying for Lauren, I just asked, Jesus, what do you think? See, last night, of course, we were telling Lauren what we think. And we are grateful and happy. We want to honor you. And he quickly led by the Holy Spirit to Genesis 49, 22, which is where Israel prophesies concerning his sons. And my eyes fell on these words. Joseph is a fruitful bough. A fruitful bough by a spring. Its branches run over a wall. The archers bitterly attacked him and shot at him and harassed him. But his bow remained firm and his arms were agile from the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, from the God of your father who helps you and by the mighty one who blesses you with the blessings of heaven and above, and with the blessings of the deep that lies beneath, the blessing of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of your father have surpassed the blessings of my ancestors. Up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, may there be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of the one distinguished among his brothers. And so as I have pondered that these last 13 years, and, uh, and we prayed that over you, the other day up there in, in Ken's gathering room. We seal us together as a family because surely that is an appropriate blessing from the word of God over you. Thank you for mothering us. Thank you for fathering us. Thank you for being the son and daughter that cooperate with the living God. And so we bless you in the name of the Lord. We know that blessing is not a casual thing, is it? It is an actual declaration and obedience to the Holy Spirit where we have the heart of God and we speak the words of God and it releases that which is created into time and eternity. And heaven and earth might be established this day for that is the testimony we have experienced. Now, of course, we have many others who have uh, nurtured us and cared for us. And we are at a boundary it's interesting, a few weekends ago, there was a celebration of the 70th year of the end of World War II, and the, so veterans were parading in this town. And there's a distinct sense, because of the great battle of the Coral Sea that took place here, that it impacted all the nations of Pacific and Asia around us, that we, like Daniel, are looking at the story of history. Daniel was a government employee. He was in somebody else's empire. He was far from his inheritance as an indigenous person to another place and he was reading a history book and he realized in the 70th year that it was time that was a change coming the fulfillment of promise was being born and he began to transact something in a childlike way in his spirit he was just eating you know pretty bad food and feeling bad about the story and yet what was happening in heavens was a 21 day battle and so we are at a transaction moment right now in which we are entering in this part of the world the future of the next 70 years. We think about the, uh, the way we will surround as a loving midwife, as affectionate friends, the nation of Papua New Guinea as we celebrate right here their, the birth that they experienced 40 years ago. We are lovers of the nations, of the peoples of the earth. And the book of Revelation talks about the, the new Jerusalem. And it says the glory and the honor of the nations will come in there before the Lord. And so as Wyman began, we were an establishment of a great diversity of nations. I remember being there in Lausanne, hearing God worshipped in French, and I just burst into tears. Because of the, the, the glory and beauty of Jesus being exalted in another language. We had incredible diversity. I think we had five different nations and two languages. And uh, I just was absolutely 
blew out my circuits in the, in the glory of it. <laughs> and so we think of foundation stones like, uh, you know, Joe and Judy Potelli that took on a spirit of adoption toward that Francophone world and then and walked with us in that way. And so I just feel like the Lord wants to, in, in honoring Lauren and Da, also honor that founding generation and those who have served us for the last 55 years and to say a series of thank yous. You know, God who teaches us to be grateful is himself grateful, far more than we ever know. Oftentimes, do you experience this? You go into a place, a new part of the kingdom of God with people you've not met, and you sense Jesus' jealous, brooding love as a heavenly parent. And he is looking at you with a kind of a severity, saying, if you only knew what they had gone through. And how we experience that is our natural mind understands very little, but our inner, and inner heart salutes everything. I often experience that. I feel I'm looking at somebody who outwardly might be an old lady, who outwardly might be a young man who might be of a different subculture to me in which I have no history or affinity, and yet my whole heart salutes because I am the temple of the Holy Spirit and the Lord who dwells within me. He's known them for their first breathing moment. He yearns for them, and he understands their whole journey. I feel like we can be sustained by the love of the Father, but we also need the embrace of the family. And so in our storytelling today, you know, God will give us a few examples and we'll transact some few things. One of the categories I think that God wants to honor, you can see what happened in Singapore where those of you who heard that, that was our last big fa family gathering. And um, we said, okay, we put a boundary. We said, we really do not want to go into the future with it, the level of our global network as a movement with uh, jurisdictions and authority titles and an overemphasis on leadership, that we need to really have an authority go viral based on vision and values and covenants and so forth. And we'll, we'll talk about that again in a minute. And so we called for the group of people and we commissioned them to simply call family gatherings like this last year. And so we've been meeting with them the last two afternoons and simply saying, how did it go, you know? And of course, they were not to be the new leaders in areas. That wasn't regime change. That was just people who would pull together family gatherings. And those family gatherings were not to be exclusive. We know that when there is a crisis on, like right now in the Mediterranean, someone needs to stand up and say, let us gather, let us pray, let us press into God, let us build an altar of worship, and may the hand of the Lord come upon all of you in the situations where you are. May God be with you. If you are leveraging off the authority of our vision and values, may the Lord be with you. Lead courageously. And that was a very strong message that came to us as we were gathering in Singapore. We have uh, been listening to the feedback, and that's part of our conversation. One of the things that we felt to do as we've been uh, listening to feedback is, is we have a growing sense of gratitude for those who led us through the story. And we felt that it was very important to reflect on and give honor the way people served us. If you think about the, the first generation of YWAM, well, there were three things that were the necessities of the times that formed our style of leadership. For instance, beginnings require unambiguous authority. As Lauren said to us years ago, you need the pilot during takeoffs, landings, and crashes. <laughs> During normal flight, you are more obsessed with, you know, I'm going to have steak or chicken, watch the movie or go to sleep. And so, therefore, the steward or the stewardess is the most important leader in your life at that point. You see that? <laughs> or to put it another way, if you're a young couple and you have little kids, what love and wisdom dictates is that you become very directive. Or in a community sense, we would say be very apostolic. You see, very proactive, unapologetic about saying, this is the way we're going to walk together who is with me. But just like a family, you know, <clears throat> if you are still giving that uh, level of directive authority and yet the family is all growing, it becomes more and more inappropriate and hurtful. The ultimate example would be, uh, you know, you have a little baby girl, fathers, you change her diaper. By the time she's six, 
that same servant function would get you arrested as a molester and imprisoned by the laws of nations because her jurisdiction of her body has increased and your servant obligation has decreased. So we've been going through that constant evolving situation and to some degree we always will. Every time a new ministry is pioneered, someone's going to have to take the courage of risking misunderstanding and declaring what vision and purpose is and boldly leading where no man has gone before and various other scriptural and Star Trek metaphors. <laughs> so for those of you over the last 55 years who encourage and audacity, got a vision in your heart, you took the risk of pushing against the rest of us and said, I believe the Lord has called me to do this. Thank you. We honor you. We honor you. We also have the type of leadership in the last 50 years was, was shaped by the milieu of that generation. Think, for instance, of technology and communications and what was required. You know, we, in many cases, we had to have very strong coordinating offices over regions and nations simply because of the obligation of communications. I can think, for instance, of the story of YWAM New Zealand nearby. And uh, if you go back, you know, uh, uh, YWAM in America is the oldest. Obviously, it's an L.A. story, Lauren and Darlene's story. But then it becomes Canada and New Zealand. So I can remember the technology that we were using. And, you know, we had zinc plates in a huge uh, cabinet, you know, and you'd bring them out. And I remember the original one we had there in Pasadena. And uh, the, you know, mimeograph machines or typing without the IBM Selectric typewriter. And so doing a correction. Was a, the whole issue of communications was incredibly expensive and laborious. You had to really, you know, you think, well, how did you recruit students in those days? Let me tell you what we had to do. To communicate, we had to all go together. We had to combine a bunch of finances from several bases. We had to have an office, a national office or a regional office. Sometimes we had to pay for a team to travel all the way to some area where there was a lot of churches in the world and where there was some kind of big festival or event and put up a booth and then hand out stuff. We developed the Go Manual in which, you know, we would go together and we would buy an ad. We had a mailing list, you know, that was an incredibly laborious thing to put together. And so this was expensive and we had, there's more power on your iPad than our national offices used to have if they were staffed by 20 people. <laughs> you know, it amazes me today. There's a young couple, he's from America, she's from Ireland, and a couple of years ago they went down to um, Queenstown, New Zealand, and they just went put up a website, and they're in an attractive location, boom, full DTSs. You see what I'm saying? How much did that cost them? I don't know, but it surely was not the huge pain in the butt that we had to deal with. You see that? And so they, you know, it's kind of like they had equal opportunity, literally, with Kona, with all our bells and whistles. You know, they were just, you know, they came right up there in the ranks and they stood beside us in that way because that's the power of communication. And so the way we did it in the past was wise and was loving and was appropriate and is not to be despised, but to be looked at with tremendous gratitude. The other thing is we relied so much on those that we commissioned into leadership and we gave them unambiguous authority because you had to trust people, because we didn't really have the codification of our vis vision and values the way we have now. It wasn't quite clear. So we, we relied on a sense that, you know, Joe and Judy Patelli are wise and trustworthy. And it was further on in our sequence that we had things like, okay, okay we do not just uh, evangelism, not just training, but we do mercy ministries. And so we, at first, of course, we didn't have Lauren's book. And now in every DTS, well, we didn't have DTS. <laughs> I was part of an experimental school that was 11 weeks long it was, it had focused on leadership training there in Lausanne, and I believe it was later deemed to be a failure. And so we were working, because you know, we never went back to that prototype. You know, we made it much longer and made sure that our actual, actual character was developed in people and all kinds of uh, values like that. And so <clears throat> for those of you who are part of that, you know, 
I'm going to, we're going to honor a special group in a minute. But for those of you who are part of that, say, let's say the first 40 years, you know, we're out 55 years. And, and those of you who are out there that we're communicating to in streaming video, uh, it, like uh, David said yesterday, stand where you are, you know. <laughs> no, if you're in bed watching this in a different time zone, remain at rest. <laughs> But those of you who are here today, you know, who want to identify, you're part of the f first 40 years of the story. Would you stand? <laughs> we love you. We honor you. We thank you for your faithfulness in that. Now, who, who among you who are those who have uh, been part of the GLF or the GLT or the International Council, those categories? Would you, would you stand? Those who have been part of those over the years. Okay, you, you can be seated. But those of you who are here, you do stand for a category that we, we really want to honor today. And um, we know that there are many, many more who will perhaps watch this uh, afterwards through some kind of device or who are watching now in, in terms of streaming video. And we just want to thank you for being midwives for a new season. That which has been born among us is the work of those people. And uh, so they, uh, you know, as we sort of it looked like we were decommissioning the leadership teams over regions, but we weren't. The only thing we were saying is that those leadership teams are not the exclusive possessors of binary authority. We're saying those are not delegates to a governing group. The authority now comes from our vision and values. It comes from a clear understanding of our story. It's beyond our ability to govern. It was becoming ineffective, and so now we are thanking those people for stewarding us through that season into this understanding. And then we also want to thank those people for continuing in their assignments because, for instance, those circles, many people have walked together. I was meeting with one of the ones in North America and I said, look, if you all drift apart and no longer meet, that shows that your unity was artificial, but it was based on government. But if you have become deeply committed to one another through these years of things that you've endured, you are a powerful priestly prophetic circle, and you should keep, you know, maintain your position. That is the, that is the, uh, the frightening reality of Exodus 19, where you see Moses, Aaron, and Hur, and then you see Joshua and Caleb, and then you see the young Israeli army facing Amalek. And so I want to say to all of you who have had formal positions within leadership structures when it was very defined, you know, prior to Singapore, do not leave the mountain. Remain in intimacy with your old friends. If necessary, get a rock under your butts and it might take three of you to hold up one person's hands like we see in that picture. But if you are not focusing... If, if they are not able to, if Joshua and Caleb, that leadership generation that's there, if they're not able to see you with your arms raised, then the young people will be slaughtered. And so I say in Jesus' name, report to duty in the morning. You are not supposed to go anywhere. You are supposed to continue in the relational context in which God has given you family and in, in the assignments that God has given you in your gifts and callings. We thank you for continuing in those things all these years. Now, even do more so. In some ways, you've been liberated from some of the yokes that were part of the necessity of the season in which we've had to walk. And this is your day. So maintain your existing circles. They are no longer exclusive. They are now to multiply to the left and the right in every direction. See that? And so those gatherings that we had uh, in the last few months, and I've been at many of them, and they're, they're just amazing because uh, the persons that were appointed to convene were, were really just putting on an event, you see. Now, they also, in order to convene, had to be people we really trusted and loved, so that's part of it. But what we mean by eldership is really just mature people 
creates circles of mature people. As we listened to feedback the other day, we've heard, learned that in some of your regions, the idea of eldership is very problematic because it has so much cultural baggage that comes with it. And one leader was just saying, we decided, all right, let's forget the debate. And we just said, we're talking about mature people, those that really know the Lord. Can we have circles of those mature people? And can they convene us in all of the thematic and geographic ways that are necessary, depending on what's happening in our family story? And the fact is, you've been all doing that for years. Just do more of it. Feel utterly released. That sense of uncovering you may have is a false thing. That sense that I don't have permission to act because I haven't been asked. This is the moment we're asking you to act. We're saying, go about your Heavenly Father's business and confidence. And you'll have that confidence based on your knowledge of the story and based on the vision and values. And we'll itemize that and make that very concrete in a minute. When we talk about completing your assignments, they are both visionary and pastoral. You cannot uncover that which is born to you. You cannot abandon that which is born to you. We went back to PNG with Tom uh, a few days ago. And as we walked the land where P and Kalafi and others had ministered, Back in 1969, you could see that Tom had a spirit of adoption in his heart. He never left PNG. His body left, but he did not depart from or abandon that place. He's carried that sense of fatherhood. Now, may that grace be upon you in all of the places in which there has been kingdom life born to you. Watch over it in unity with others. And move in the spirit of adoption more proactively than you ever have been. You know, I think about, you know, let's make this very clear what we mean by assignments. You might think, well, it's all got vague. It's all very vague and we have no authority. But when any circle of people affirm the calling of somebody and they boldly lead in an assigned area. Think of the way that Lynn Green has served us in communications. You know, when it comes to our websites and those things... You know, it would have been originally that Lynn and Ian and I did things as a governing body called Team 3. And so we laid that down a long time ago. But then we said to Lynn, look, the hand of the Lord is upon you. And you are excellent in that. And we honor you in that. And we need you in that. Would you please keep doing that? See that? By the way, I'm calling right now for those of you who have that calling to fully support him. And then he really would like to be replaced as a person under the pressure of being at point, you see. But that's worked out as love and wisdom dictates, and you need to do that boldly. I was appointed to an institutional role with a title, the president. In 09, I felt that I was just to say to my peers, I'm not going to use that name anymore. I don't think that's appropriate in any way. I'm going to invent terminology for myself. But what I was doing, I realized that when I was commissioned there in 2002, the, in the commissioning, there were very two specific things. Number one was go after and encourage the reanimation of our ship equipped network and encourage the tip of the arrow, which is evangelism. I have never laid that down. You see that? That is an assignment out of heaven that came by prophetic revelation in a time of prayer, was affirmed by my peers, and was commissioned by the laying on of hands. You see? And it has nothing to do with an institutional reality, nor is it exclusive to me. But I'm going to walk through that until God lifts that from me for the rest of my life. You see that? That's what we mean by an assignment. So there is a huge amount of work that needs to be done to maintain our movement. Now, what about at the local institutional level? We have a word that might sound contradictory, and that is that we are to strengthen institutionality. When you think, for instance, of the nature of legal complexity and the way we interface with the spheres, the operations of ships, the nature of the university. It, we're not anti-institutional. We're just saying that that is not the paradigm through which we see ourselves as a movement above that which we've pioneered and run. Think of an institution, you know, perhaps the one we could most easily understand is we have thousands of preschools that Youth of the Mission has established. Now, you have a social contract with those parents to deliver the goods and services that is implied by your advertising, by your having a building and saying, at a certain time of day, you can drop your kids off and we will take care of them and we will teach them godly values. You see that? 
And at that level, we have to be rigid, unyielding, institutional, and authoritarian. In other words, if you're screwing up, we may have to counsel you to death, get you out of that position, and find someone that's really anointed to do it because we want the program to work. You see that? That has to do with integrity. So when it comes to legal compliance and wisdom and tax law and uh, you know, the excellence of institutional management, we need more and more and more of that than we ever have. So these are not contradictory things. And the people who have led us in the past and shone in that area are to be deeply honored today. So what's your assignment? May the Spirit of God come and bring a, an illumination of that right now. You know, David, I just feel like maybe this is a moment to, to honor those who have served on the GLT and the GLF. Yeah, so those of you who are in that category who stood a minute ago, uh, we want to create a memory right now. Lauren has written a lovely letter of affirmation. Uh, we've got it that in a way that's a presentation gift to you. Uh, those others have served who are several hundred people over the years. We're going to uh, find a way of getting that to you. But w let's just gather around that faithful group of people who served us and, um, and then bless them with our whole heart right now. Good. <clears throat> so I'm wondering if those people could come forward to the front, please. Come up to the front. Those who have been in the old GLF, GLT, uh, if you'd come up to the front, <clears throat> and I'd like... Uh, Lauren to come up and uh, yeah the International, International Council, well, yeah. GLT, GLF uh, yeah I think just on the front here Last evening, you gave me great honor. And as I was saying to a brother that was coming up and, and expressing to me uh, happy birthday and honor, I said, you know, I realized that like uh, Alejandro was giving us an e example of a mother I think she is around 100 years old, and they, she was being interviewed with her family, which was 150 children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren. And they said, how could you do this? She says, no, I just raised my eight kids, tried to do it right, and then they did the same, and the next did the same, and the next did the same. Now we're 150. That's why we That's why we And that's what we have to realize. Even as you honor those that have gone before you, you also realize greater things are you going to do than we've done. Because even uh, as John talked about the, the mimeograph, before that, we used the spirit duplicator, it was called. You know, <laughs> you have to be old to know even what that was. But, yeah, you got purple on your hands and also much on the paper. But uh, as we honor those here today, we are honoring all of you. And that's what was happening last night. We're honoring you. And it's as we recognize and appreciate, and as the fifth commandment says, honor thy father and the mother that your days may be long. And that means not just long, you know, drawn out, but it means fruitful too. And so as, as we have that honoring time today, we want to express to these that they really did sacrifice. Leaders coming together are... are trying to believe God for plane tickets and, and time out from their families and their, their locale uh, responsibilities and so on. And so there, there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into this, 
And that's what we also want to say and appreciate. And Darlene is a lot better at thanking and, and uh, appreciating than me. I'm on to the next thing because I'm, I'm, I'm still thinking about the future. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a fallacy, actually, a, a weakness in my life. Well, I don't know how long I want to take with that, but... <laughs> I do want to say our fellow friends and co-workers, in all the years that we have gathered together, there's always been this anticipation in our heart that we're getting to be with some of our best friends. And we're just so grateful for your commitment. Grateful for the word of the Lord that resides in you. Grateful for the way you have formed the vision and the mission and led us into the covenants that hold us together now today. And so all we're doing today is acknowledging that which is and saying it's going to get so much better. But as John so exhorted all of you, we mustn't pull back from what God's called us to. As long as we've got breath in our, in our, in our, in our bodies and strength in our bodies, we've got to keep on going. There's no time limit on this. And uh, the wisdom and experience that you have experienced that's to be that multiplication factor. It's not to be held to with you. So we really bless you and thank you. So many of you I know so, so well. And so many of you, I have been in the places where you minister. And um, when uh, somewhere on the stage yesterday, I think particularly of you, CeeLo, because I've known you for such a long time. And I thought about how much pride I have in my heart. Uh, for who you are and the workers that are here today because you're here. And it isn't just, it, it's, it, the rejoicing comes not in just the strength of your leadership. The rejoicing comes in seeing the fruitfulness and meeting the people which you have discipled. And I could say that about all of you. And uh, I think about King's Kids last night, Dale, and how we were together when that started. And it's the fruitfulness. And, and all of us, we just do what God's called us to do and have so much fun doing it. Do we have the things to hand out? Yes, hand them out, and let's uh, come up and pray over these people during the break. We're going to have a break. You have something to say? We'll just get behind them and lay hands on them and bless them. We're just going to go down the line. Darlene and, uh, is going to start at one end, and I'll start at the other, and we're just going to pray a brief blessing over each one. But would you just extend a hand of blessing to them? Would you do that? And, of course, there are many others out there that are on streaming video that we can't uh, bless today in person. But we thank you, Lord, for each one of these. And we pray the blessings of God the Father. And through us, we have that privilege of laying hands upon and blessing, Lord, each one of these for all that they have done, but now all of the much more they're going to do, not only in their own lives, but through the lives of others that they have fathered or mothered. And we thank you, Lord, that with this blessing comes your, your anointing at a new level and a new participation in responsibility with God and for God and through Jesus Christ into the world. And, Lord, until you take us home, we're, we're still here to serve you. We don't have an ending. We don't have a retirement. We have a beginning, and a new beginning always starts with a new anointing in Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for that anointing and for that purpose that you have called us into your kingdom and for your glory and honor and praise to Jesus because ultimately it all goes back to you, King Jesus. As we thank you, Lord, for these who have been faithful, these who have led the way in so many times and seasons and difficulties and great triumphs and all of it goes together, but we lay it back down at the feet of Jesus like in Revelation chapter 21, and we give you all the glory, all the praise, all the honor in Jesus' name.